Yeah, it doesn't roll off the tongue like closed loops and frozen scoops. That one's that one's the clear favorite so far. <laughs> but I'm imagining the every day there would be an integral of the day, like on a chalkboard or something, and if you can solve it, you get a free kid scoop or something like that. And then the sizes would be given by like integrals. Yeah. So if you want like two scoops, you'd be like, can I have a double integral, please? Or can I have a triple integral, please? Where would the shop be at? I don't know. We could put it in Westwood. Maybe where Stan's was now that that's gone. And all the sprinkles would look like arrows, so that if you get sprinkles, it would look like you have a vector field on your ice cream. Um, yeah, stands closed a couple weeks, couple weeks ago. Or is, yeah, it's probably been longer than that. Yikes. I was trying to come up with good flavor names also, but I was struggling there. So again, if, if you have ideas, I'm all ears. Yeah, so the guy commenting uh, wanna be friends comments on like all new YouTube videos. So it's not just me. It's some kind of bot that spans like every new YouTube video that goes up. It's ridiculous. Um, and I East doesn't like ice cream. Wow. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Is vegan ice cream a thing? It's got to be, right? Yeah. We would we would for sure have vegan ice cream. Okay, wow, she didn't like it before. Right now I'm working on, so you guys can get excited for maybe next week. I'm also looking to get into the educational children's television market. So I have some ideas for a children's television show that would be aimed at ages like three to seven to introduce multivariable calculus starring me and Noah. I've got a couple ideas, so we'll see. Okay, I'll take a, I'll eat a few more bites of my salad and then we'll get going. Noah doesn't know about all these plans yet. Um, oh, okay. So I got a private suggestion that Noah could be a kangaroo. One of my ideas was Noah the boa and it would be like a snake themed cartoon show. Um, but yeah, kangaroo is good actually. Yeah, exactly. So Noah could contort himself into different curves and be like, all right, kids, today we're going to compute the integral over me. And then, you know, like depending on what shape he's in. I don't know what I would be. Um, for that idea, I'm not sure. For other show ideas, I kind of know my role, but I could be another kind of snake. Um, Yeah, you could teach a five-year-old how to do integrals. I bet I could.
Okay. We'll get going. Um, in a landslide victory, closed loops and frozen scoops wins. So that's what we're going with. Um, later, I have a question about the slogan. So stay tuned for that. That can be our, our break time. Um, <clears throat> share my screen. And we will begin. So the plan for tonight, as usual, I have a bunch of examples prepared. And I, I would like to focus at least initially on these examples that I have prepared just for the sake of having something new to work on since you guys have had practice midterms for a while and stuff like that. But then, you know, as the night goes on, if we, we get bored, or if you have questions about the practice midterms, we can certainly talk about those. If you have questions about anything else, we can certainly talk about that. Um, we can do whatever you want. But at least initially, we can focus on some of these kind of new examples that I've, I've come up with. Um, as always, if you have questions at any time, you can let me know. I'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, Are there any change of variables examples that we have? Yeah, I could come up with some. I, so I don't, I haven't seen the midterm. I don't know if that kind of stuff will be on there. Like I, I think I would focus on the stuff since midterm one. Um, yeah, we can do that at some point. I definitely have some like spherical coordinate, stuff like that planned. Yeah, so Coco Flux is good. So Thursday, I, was that Thursday that I posed serial names? Tuesday. My ideas for serial names were Polar Puffs was one of them and then Frosted Flux. Yeah. Frosted Flux I thought was pretty good. Oh, Tuesday was TV shows. I can't even remember. Okay. Oh, Fruit, oh, fruit Loops is good too. Yeah. Let's do this. So like I said, I've, I've got some examples we can warm up with a with a, a line integral first, but maybe before we do that, are there any preliminary questions for me, guys? Hmm. All right. We'll hit the road then. Um, like I said, maybe we can warm up with, with this one right here. So I've had it up for a little while. I guess you can read it. Um, will those weird surface conservative things be on the test? Like the ring on a sphere. The ring on a sphere. I don't know if I know what you're talking about. Um, okay, so if the question is like, will Noah give you a ridiculous looking shape and ask if it's simply connected? I would be surprised. I guess he could, um, but I, I kind of doubt it. I think he was doing some examples like that that day during class, just because first of all, they're kind of fun to think about and to get you guys thinking about what it means to be simply connected, but, and no worries, but that, that's, that's not really the focus of a class like this. So I don't think so. I think if you can just identify when like subsets of the plane are simply connected, you're probably in good shape. Um, so then if you find a potential function, do you still need to specify a domain that the field is conservative on? Yes, you do. So, so the, the best answer to that is if you find a potential function, every function comes equipped with a domain. 
you may not think about it that way, but if I write down a function like x squared plus y, lurking in the background is some kind of domain. So if you're finding a potential function for the goal of declaring something to be conservative, you would still need to talk about um, a domain. But you could just use the domain of whatever function you find. That would be the domain. Will the notes be uploaded? Yeah, I'll, I'll upload these. And then, like I said, I'm recording this. And so maybe tomorrow morning or something, depending on when this finishes, I'll upload the video as well. Also, maybe the last self plug I'll make before we start doing some math is, in case you haven't seen yet, but over the past week, I did make a handful of videos all about this conservative vector field stuff and simply connected domains and, and path independence and all this nonsense that we've been talking about. So if, if any of that's been confusing, um, you can check some of those out. Okay. Yes, video qualities have, the quality of the videos has definitely increased. Um, surprising isn't that when you practice something and you do something over and over and over again, you get better at it. Who would have thought? Okay. So we have a curve of intersection between two surfaces, x plus y equals z squared, and x plus 2y plus z equals 1. And I'm specifying that the curve is traveling from this point to this other point, or it's between these two points. And here's all I want to do for this first problem. I just want to take this line integral, convert it into a single variable integral. Don't even have to compute it. We just want to go through the steps of setting up and computing the line integral. OK. So the first thing to remember in the process of evaluating any line integral, whether it's a vector line integral or a scalar line integral like we're working with here, Maybe that's one thing I'll point out is, you know, this is a scalar line integral because the function that we're integrating is just a scalar value function. And also because I see a ds here, that's what indicates to me that this is a scalar line integral. But regardless of the kind of line integral, if you're going to evaluate it directly, your first step is to parameterize the curve. And this is usually like the most non-trivial part of problems like this. So what we have to do is we have to figure out how to parameterize this stuff. Now, uh, usually I draw a picture, but to be completely honest, any kind of picture I would try to draw would just look terrible. And in my mind, maybe it would help, but I don't know what, that if it would, it would help a whole lot. So I might not draw a picture. Now, you know, over the weekend, if you get something like this, you can graph these things in GeoGebra to get an idea of what it looks like. But I can fall back on my general strategy for parameterizing intersections of surfaces. So what is that strategy? So parameterizing intersections of surfaces. And you know, you've heard me say this a lot at this point. We talked about this a lot even back in 32A last quarter, but what do I typically try to do? I try to use one of the equations to pick two of the variables. And then if you can successfully do that, then the other equation will force the choice of the third variable you won't have a choice what that third variable is. So then other equation um, forces third choice. That doesn't really make sense, but you know what I mean by that. Okay, now what's the problem here? When I talk about this strategy and when we've seen this in the past, usually 
at least in all of the examples I've done this quarter so far, one of the surface equations only has two variables. And that's what I typically mean by this, is that I latch on to the equation that has two variables, pick them that way, and then move on to the next equation. But there's kind of an obvious hurdle here, which is, well, both of the surfaces involve all three of the variables. So, oh my God, what do we do? Well, we can just do some algebra. And if this kind of situation happens where you have two surfaces that involve all three variables, the first thing I would do is I would do some algebra with these two equations to just generate an equation with only two variables. So what do I mean by that? My first step here, for example, is we could solve for x to get an equation with uh, only two variables. So for example, uh, this first surface says that x is z squared minus y. So then if I plug that into the second equation, I get z squared minus y plus 2y plus z equals 1. And now I have an equation that only has two variables. Let's see, this is like z squared plus y plus z equals 1. And okay, so initially we had two, all three variables in both, but I can quickly do some algebra to reduce it to exactly what this strategy is referring to. Now I can run this into action. This equation only has two variables, so what could I do? I would look at it and I would think, well, um, y, I can write this as a function of z, right? y has to be 1 minus z minus z squared, <clears throat> I think. The point being, since y is a function of z, in my parameterization, I can just declare z to be t. So let z be t. Am I allowed to do that? I can do whatever I want, as long as y plays along. So then I don't have a choice then y has to be 1 minus t minus t squared. And then x, now we've chosen y and z, so we don't have a choice. x has to be whatever z squared minus y is. So then x has got to be z squared is going to be t squared. Um, minus y is like this. And so I guess this would be 2t squared plus t minus 1, I think. All right, cool. So there we go. So we've got almost part of a parameterization. We've got the formula. But what do you need to provide anytime you give a parameterization? You need to give a domain for your parameter. Very important. So don't forget that. Let's see. So x we called 2t squared plus t minus 1. y was this mess. And z was t. <laughs> But like I said, we have to figure out the t domain. So what do I do? I go back and read the question again and I say, oh, okay, so the points, so the curve is traveling between two points. Um, this and this, and this is the information that we're gonna use to figure out the t domain. And you can do this in a number of ways, but roughly what we just need to figure out is what t value puts me at this point and what t value puts me at this point? Well, 
I think the easiest thing to do would be to look at the Z component, right? Because Z is T. Yeah, Amon's got it. So like, for example, here, the Z component is zero. So T has to be zero. And here, Z is one. So T has to be one. There's a parameterization for the curve. And maybe in my solution, I would just note that um, the starting, the endpoints are actually the two points that we care about. Yeah, could I repeat the, um, let me write that out. So I'll repeat that and I'll also write something down. So I'll remind you that in the statement of the problem, so I don't have to keep scrolling up, one of these points is negative one, one, zero. And the other point is two, negative one, one. So to get the domain for T, what I'm thinking about is what T value for what T is, for example, the expression I got equal to this first point. So what I would do, and probably what Aman did maybe, is he said, well, if I want to figure out what T value I plug in here to spit out this point, I can in particular latch onto the Z coordinate, which is T, and then here it's zero. So these coordinates tell me that T has to be zero to spit out that endpoint. And then likewise for the other point, um, T would have to be one to spit out that endpoint. So this gives T equals zero. And then likewise, whoops. <coughs> Two, negative one, one gives T equals one. So like I said, maybe in my solution, I would just observe that I do end up at the right points. Now maybe here's a question, and we can check that I wrote the problem correctly. Let's make sure we actually do. R of zero is negative one, one, zero. Okay, good. So that checks out. And then R of one is, two plus one is three minus one is two. 1 minus 1 is 0, minus 1 is negative 1, and then 1. Okay, checks out. Now maybe here's a question for you guys. Do we care about the orientation of the curve here? Jessica says no, I agree. Uh, you know, one thing to point out is that in the, yeah, exactly. So. And the other thing I'll point out is that in the statement of the problem, I didn't even really give an orientation. Like I didn't, depending on how you interpret my words, I didn't really say we're necessarily going from this point to this point. I just said the curve is between the two points. So at least as I, how I'm reading the question, we don't really have an orientation. But maybe I'll just because we're reviewing everything, um, Curve orientation does not matter for scalar line integrals. So we also know because we weren't given a vector field. Yeah, I guess so in that sense. I mean, yeah, so we, we know that the orientation doesn't matter just because we know that we're working with a scalar line integral. Yeah. Anyway, something to point out. And okay, anyway, that was step one. We've got our parameterization. That's the hard part. What's step two in this process? In a scalar line integral, um, so let me, I'll address Alfred's question in a second. In a scalar line integral, um, 
your next step is to compute ds, which is going to be the magnitude of the speed. No, never mind. It's going to be the magnitude of the velocity of your parameterization. So maybe let me compute that really quickly. And then I'll talk about the length thing. Um, so our prime here is going to be, let's see, 4t plus 1. And then negative 1 minus 2t. And then 1, 2t. The magnitude of that vector is going to be the square root of the first thing squared plus the second thing squared plus the third thing squared. And then we could simplify it, but you know, we don't actually have to evaluate the integral, so I don't need to worry too much about simplifying it. So I'll just leave it like that for now. Okay, so then the question was, so a scalar line integral computes the length of the line. Is that correct? Sometimes. So the scalar line integral maybe has something else to recall, is if you integrate one ds, this gives you the length of c. But that's very specific to when the integrand is the function one. Um, you know, very generally, you want to think about a scalar line integral as a weighted sum over chunks of the curve. So what's happening here is if you compute a line integral of one, you're just breaking the curve into a bunch of little chunks and you're assigning the weight one to each of those chunks. And so then when you add everything up, well, everything has equal unit weight. So you kind of generate the length of the curve. But um, it's, it is not the case here that we're computing the length of the curve because this function is something, something else. Um, so this, this, whatever answer we would get here, if we actually computed it, it would not represent the length of the curve. You could think about it as being like, if this represented density or something, you could think about this as giving you the mass of the, the curve. But, oh my God, there's a lot of thought bubbles in this problem. Okay, so what's your third step? You just convert the integral into a single variable integral by using your parameter bounds and then plugging your parameterization into the function and then multiplying by the expression you got for ds. That's the last thing we have to do. So to finish it off, this line integral that we care about, and I forget what the integrand is, x plus 2y, is going to be the integral from 0 to 1. This came from our parameter bounds. Now, f of the parameterization f is x plus 2y, so we're going to take x plus 2 times y. So 2t squared plus t minus 1 plus 2 times y is 1 minus t minus t squared. So that's kind of disgusting. You could probably simplify it a lot more, but this part right here is this part. And then I just take this expression that we got for ds, pop that in there, and we're done. <laughs> okay, so let me look at, and again, if you wanted to, you could try to evaluate it, but we don't have to. Um, so do you have to do the magnitude of r prime thing every single time you change from ds? So then you said never mind. Yeah, yeah. So the 
this this step right here, um, step two, this is specific to the scalar case. In the vector line integral case, the dr vector thing, it's a vector, so you just leave off the magnitude bars here and you just use the vector r prime. But in the scalar case, to get ds, which is like a change in length, which is a scalar quantity, we do want to take the magnitude of r prime. And yet, midterm's going to go up midnight LA times. So five and a half hours from now. Okay, that was our warm up problem for tonight. Pretty standard process going through the steps of computing a scalar line integral. Any questions about that one? What would be a real world application for the scalar line integral? So one of the things I mentioned earlier was if you think about the function here, x plus two y as being the density of this curve. So you could think about like a wire or something with density. The scalar line integral is gonna be the mass of the, the curve. That would be one example. Um, don't press me for more because I'm a math grad student, so I live in a bubble closed off from the real world, and nothing I do actually matters. Okay, Katie asks, will it normally specify whether we need to give the answer in scalar or vector? So if the question is, like, will the problem tell me if it's a scalar, like, will it tell me in words if it's a scalar or vector line integral? Probably not, maybe, maybe not. Um, but like in this problem, I did not say that. Um, so it's kind of up to you to recognize that this is a scalar line integral. So that's something I would definitely be able to do. I would, I would definitely be able to look at something and be able to tell, is this thing a scalar line integral or is it a vector line integral? And really the, you know, there are a couple things you can say, but, I think the easiest thing to latch on to is if you see a DS, that's a scalar line integral. And in contrast, if you see something like this, it's a vector line integral. Um, when can I call myself a mathematician? I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever feel like one. Okay, give me a sec really quick. Um, my mom asked, how's it going? Okay, and then I got a private question, which was, if there isn't a DS, can we assume it's a vector line integral? Yeah, I think that's, that's a good principle. Like I said, but I think there are various things to, to check, but the fact that this is a function, you know, that's another indication. Okay, cool. Let's move on to something else. Okay, we'll come back to spherical coordinates. Uh, let's do that later. I wanna do one of these vector field problems. Um, I want to do one of these vector field problems before we get too tired and you guys stop paying attention because this kind of stuff is fun and it's really important and it's some of the new stuff that we've you know dealt with on the homework this past week and have been talking about in class so here's here's the problem here's a vector field it should probably look pretty familiar 
negative y over x squared plus y squared, and then x over x squared plus y squared. And then c is the curve defined by x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals one, oriented clockwise. We're supposed to evaluate the line integral of f over this curve. And, you know, maybe just to tie back to what we were talking about, <clears throat> um, this thing right here, oops, I can tell that this is a vector line integral. A couple reasons. Like I said, you know, one of the things that we're integrating is a vector field. And then I'm dotting with dr. And that's like a vector quantity, so I can tell that this is a vector line integral. Okay. Now, I want to hear if you guys have ideas, but maybe I'll let you think of ideas and then I'll talk about Anna's question, which is a good one. This can go in a thought bubble. So the question is, um, does a little circle around the integral sign mean line integral? Or is there a time that we need to use that notation? So you don't ever need to use this notation. And I usually don't. Um, if you want to make the math look cool, I guess you can. But yeah, this just means, so you're only allowed to write this if C is a closed loop. Um, but even if C is a closed loop, like you don't have to write this, you can still write like I did here, you can still just write that. So like if I wanted to, I could have drawn a little circle here, but I didn't have to. So if you want to use it, you can. The only thing you can't do is draw this circle when the curve is not a closed loop. So yeah, it's just there to make, it's really there to make what you're doing look impressive to your friends. Um, I'm assuming lines don't count as closed loops. That's correct. So a closed loop is a, a one dimensional thing that does not have a boundary. Um, well, you know what a closed loop is. Okay. Any ideas for this one? So is C still a circle of radius one? Okay, so this is, this is a good question that Elijah has, but which is, he's kind of pointing out that this, this is not a circle. It's gonna look pretty similar to a circle. It'll just kind of be a little closer to a square. So if I draw the curve, Notability better not think that this is a circle. It's going to make me really mad. Um, that's a little too squarish. Um, but the, the higher the powers these are, so like if you took, and you can graph this in like Wolfram Alpha or something, but if you did x to the billion, I think, unless I have this backwards, this either looks like a square or like a caved in thing. And I'm too lazy to think about that right now. Anyway, it's a closed loop, but it's definitely not a circle. Okay, so then there's some ideas which um, are, looks like we could do polar coordinates. Maybe, I, so I don't know if I know exactly what you mean by that because, so I'm gonna be picky, but Okay, it looks like a square. Yeah, yeah. So the idea is that if, if you make these numbers bigger and bigger and bigger, it'll get closer and closer to a square. Okay. Um, so I don't know if I know what you mean by polar coordinates specifically, just because polar coordinates, you want to think about this as being a transformation for double integrals, but we're doing like a line integral. Um, and then another idea was we could parameterize by root cosine and root sine. Let me run with that idea. 
And then if anyone has other ideas, I'm all ears too. But so there's a suggested, suggested, um, okay, so some more ideas. So let me, let me write down one of the things. And then we'll think about some of these other ideas. So I got a private question, which was, where's the recording going to be posted on my YouTube channel? Subscribe. <laughs> but yeah, in all seriousness, on YouTube, you can go to my website. Um, I have a link to the YouTube channel. And on my website, I have direct video links to all the videos. So you can go to my website if you want. Yes. Okay, so then you know like i said i do want to think about this parameterization but we can think about some of these other ideas which is well we could check if it's conservative i like that because <laughs> um again if it's if it's conservative this is a closed loop and we would get zero but you all worked on the homework for like 40 hours over the past week and what can you guys tell me about this vector field Um, okay, so yes, yeah, so this, this splitting technique, that's a great idea too. Um, there's, this is the vortex field. Okay, I can't keep up with all the comments, so let me just make some comments. Um, this is not a conservative vector field on the largest possible domain. Yeah, Julius is correct. So we'll come back to this parameterization because I do want to think about this, but um, note that F is not conservative. Actually, let me put this in a thought bubble. So maybe from homework, we know that F is not conservative on the largest possible domain, which is R2 minus the origin. Okay, so now if this, so let me make the domain explicit. The domain here is everything, or well, that domain, you know, I didn't specify a domain, but that domain would be like everything except the origin. And the vector field is not conservative on that domain. So to bounce around some of these other ideas, I think someone pointed out that, well, the curl of this is zero. I agree. That's maybe something that we could compute, but let's record that. So we'll check that, but the curl is zero. Um, what was I going to say? The curl is zero, so on simply connected domains, it's conservative. But can we place this loop in a simply connected domain? Um, we can't. So Elijah asks, uh, is the domain x greater than or equal to zero simply connected? It would be, so that would look like this. One problem that we'd have there is that you contain the origin. So you could say like this except for the origin. That would be simply connected, but then the problem is like I can't fit the whole loop in there. So using, using conservativeness like very quickly, we could use symmetry, maybe. Um, but I, I wanna latch on to a couple ideas. Um, but using conservativeness so that to get like a quick solution probably won't work here because of all these reasons. So we need to be a little more clever. And so some people have had a good idea. Um, Earlier there's this curve splitting idea, and then I think this is what Katie's getting at too, is like we could just pick a circle instead and figure out what that is. But before we do that, I just, I just wanna ask you guys, like if I wanted to parameterize the curve, you know, like let's say I just wanted to parameterize this curve, would this work? Or are there some issues with it? I do want to think about this because a point of a lot of these problems is that 
if you get a problem like this and it seems really hard to approach directly, there's probably a clever solution. And yeah, so I think you guys are pointing out that like it would it would parameterize the circle for some values of t. But we have some issues like I wouldn't be allowed to take the square root of a negative sign. So it wouldn't be able to trace out the whole curve. It would probably just trace out like this chunk. And so you could do like a multi-piece parameterization or something, but this parameterization doesn't really work. And even if it did, let's just let's just think about this like i said this is important this is a point of the problem to me um and even if it did so i got a, i just now got a private question which is yeah pretty much what i was about to say is that like even if we could find a parameterization things would get really complicated right like this expression does not play nicely at all with this stuff. Someone, I forget who, but someone pointed out earlier that this kind of thing feels like polar coordinates is a good idea, or it feels kind of polar, but this is not. Like the fact that this is blah, blah, blah to the fourth really screws things up. And so you're welcome to try, but like if, if you try to set up the integral directly, so because of these fourth powers, um, uh, also, I just realized I forgot to draw the orientation clockwise. So that looks like this. Anyway, doing anything directly here is almost certainly going to be really hard. Um, doing directly. equals not a good idea so we have to do something clever and so it took me a while to get there but a couple people have suggested now a good idea which is we could instead of integrating around this curve play this game of like drawing lines to other curves and stuff like that to instead integrate over a simpler curve So the kind of thing that Noah did Wednesday and mentioned today a little bit and the kind of thing that I did yesterday in discussion, this could work here. So I think um, Katie mentioned, yeah, we could just do a circle. So one of the things that you should have taken away from maybe the homework assignment is that if you integrate this thing around a circle, it's very easy, right? And I think this is maybe what the polar coordinate idea was, was getting at, but like this vector field plays very nicely with circles. So what we could do instead is we could say, um, instead of integrating, <laughs> around C directly, we pick a different, will utilize a different path. Maybe let me say it that way. And Katie says circle, so I'm going to pick a circle. You know, you could any, literally any circle would work, but maybe just for, to make this easy to draw, let me pick the circle of radius. I don't know. How about that? So I'll let C2 be the circle of radius 2 oriented. How do you want to orient it? First comment wins. It literally doesn't matter. We could pick either. Okay, C stands for. Kimberly is first. I'm going to say C stands for clockwise. So let's go clockwise. But you could pick counterclockwise. Like anything would work. <laughs> um, it doesn't, it just changes some negative signs, but it should still work in the end. So if you don't believe me, pick the other direction. 
Um, okay, so let me draw a picture of that. I want to have a good picture too. And I know this curve isn't a square, but I'm just going to draw it as a square just because a squarish type thing. So there's C. Um, and then what did I pick? I picked the circle of radius two. Beautiful. All right, screw you. And what did we decide clockwise? I'm gonna call this C2. Why did I pick radius two? To make the picture easy to draw. Um, um, but like I said, literally any circle would work. Um, you could pick a circle, you could pick the unit circle. The picture would look kind of weird and you'd have to be a little careful, but it would work. You could pick a circle of radius like 0.1, you could pick a circle of radius a billion. It really actually doesn't matter. And if you don't believe me, I encourage you to try, but I just, I picked a circle of radius two so that I could have space to draw things between the two curves. So here's, here's the game that we want to play. What's the point? Maybe let me do this first. I bet that we could actually compute the integral around this circle. Let's do that. Let's compute the integral around C2 of F. Okay, so quick practice. <laughs> oh God, yeah. So quick practice with vector line integrals. Um, <laughs> what do we do? Oh, hey, Joe. We parameterize the curve, and this is what is making Katie uncomfortable. Um, one way to parameterize the curve is, it's not the only way, but we could call x sine of t, two, uh, root two, sorry, I picked radius two. So we could call x root two sine of t and root two cosine of t is y. Uh, so t between zero and two pi. Good times. Fall quarter feels like a long time ago now. Think about how much math you've learned since then. Okay, so this goes like this. So then what do we do? We need r prime. Our prime of t is going to be root 2 cosine t, root uh, negative root 2 sine t. Oh, yeah, I'm confusing myself. I said radius 2. Thanks. So these are 2 sine t and 2 cosine t, so I'll get a negative 2 sine t. then the integral over this curve is gonna be integrate from zero to two pi, the vector field, Chad is going so fast, thank you guys. Um, so, neg so x squared plus y squared, maybe let me write this up here, with my new parameterization, this is gonna be four, right? Because we're dealing with the circle of radius two. So I'll get negative y, which is negative this. So I get negative 2 cosine t over 4, comma. Um, yeah, and so Trina says uh, we could also, we could have picked, you could do a number of different parameterizations, but if you pick something like negative cosine sine, that would also be a clockwise parameterization. That's correct. So negative y and then x is 2 sine t over x squared plus y squared is 4 dot r prime of t is this vector.
Don't we just figure it out? And no one should be surprised that we should get, end up getting two pi, or we should get end up get end up getting negative two pi rather. So I'll get a negative cosine squared plus negative sine squared because all the fours cancel out. That's negative one. We get negative two pi. Okay, so. We know the integral around C2, and this is what we're going to use to figure out the integral around the blue squarish thing. <laughs> okay, so I got, a, I got a private question, which is a good question. Let me talk about this, because this came up in Noah's lecture when we talked about this stuff. But let me just quickly record what we figured out. So the private question I got was, could we use um, could we use the parameterization two cosine t, two sine t from two pi to zero? I want to say no. Um, but the, the answer is unfortunately, yeah, the screen wasn't frozen. I was just thinking. <laughs> um, I would prefer that you don't do that. I want to say no. The, so what, maybe what, let me write something down. If you set up the integral like this with the regular parameterization, um, you would get the same answer. In that sense, it would work. But when you write this down, it's going to look weird. And you can't say this. Um, yeah, so this is the only reason that I say that I wouldn't just tell you no is because Noah said you could. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you that if you do that, it'll make whoever's grading your test maybe a little uncomfortable, and it could come across confusing if you're not careful about what you're writing out. Um, so if you want to do that, okay. I would probably, if possible, stick to an interval that it's kind of ordered in the correct way. Okay, I, I just got a lot of messages. Let me try to catch up with... Um, catch up with questions. So I got a private question, which was what happens with the origin since this parameter includes it? So the, the parameterization, the curve does not go through the origin. T is, is zero, but T being zero corresponds to like this point on the curve. So we don't pass through the origin. And then a private question was, how to know what works as a parameterization of, for clockwise or counterclockwise? Um, again, there are multiple different ways to, to change what the orientation looks like, but maybe just as a quick, um, quick fix answer. Um, if you want counterclockwise, that's the usual way. So it's like cosine sine. And if you want clockwise, you could use sine cosine. Okay. What's written after the negative six? Yeah, I probably... Sorry for my bad handwriting. Negative six is actually a negative cosine squared. Oh, I see. I was like, wow, that's impressive if I, yeah. So this was a negative, that wasn't much better, negative cosine squared. Okay, so then a question was, why can we directly integrate over the circle instead of the square shape? So we are definitely not done. Um, we've still got some work to do, but kind of the takeaway from the past couple of days of lecture is that this game where you like connect curves and stuff to relate integrals to each other, they'll end up being the same. 
but we're, we have some work to do to show that. Okay, private question was, is R of T equals to two sine T? So why did I parameterize that way? Because we decided to do a clockwise orientation, that's correct. Is it because F is conservative? Oh, that was a follow-up. That's So F isn't conservative on the whole domain, but we'll use the fact that it's conservative on simply connected domains. But we're definitely not done. Why would you be able to, private question was, why would you be able to choose a parameter that has a radius smaller than the square? So I mentioned that I could have picked a circle smaller than the square and it'll work. The game that we'll play is gonna work. So it'll, it, you'll just see that the kind of argument doesn't really depend on which one's bigger or smaller. Okay, and then one more private question was, this proves that the function is not conservative over the domain. That's a good question, that's correct. So in other words, what we've just shown is that this function is, this vector field is not conservative. Um, because we just exhibited a path, a closed loop, which integrates to something non-zero. So this is definitely not conservative on the domain, which is the pink world minus the origin up here. That's correct. Okay, and then one more private question was, can we play this game with every question ever? Not necessarily, because um, one of the things that we're gonna use here is that the curl of this vector field is zero. That's gonna be important. So let me write that down. Note that, and then we'll continue on to actually relate these two, but this was the kind of the first computation here. So note that the curl of F is zero. We could compute that, but you guys had to compute this in the homework, so I don't want to do that, just for the sake of time. But you get zero. This means, this is the important part here, and this is one of the life lessons to take away from the last couple weeks, is that on simply connected domains, Um, F is conservative. Okay, and then question was, I know I should understand this, but why can we just omit the origin from the domain? Well, it's not that we can, it's that we have to. Because if I look at the vector field, this thing that I wrote here is not defined at the origin. So the way you should think about it is like whatever domain you want to pick for the vector field, and we haven't done like we haven't really done that yet, but whatever domain you pick, you are not allowed to pick the origin. It's not that like I'm omitting it by choice. If I could include it, I definitely would, because then we'd have like a really nice simply connected domain. But doesn't having a singularity mean that it's not simply connected? Yes. So the pink domain that I drew here which I haven't even actually used yet, this is definitely not simply connected. That's correct. <clears throat> um, okay, then I got a private question, which was, so this, does this method of like introducing new curves and doing this whole thing, does this only work if the curl is zero? Um, for now, yes, but stay tuned. Pretty soon we're gonna learn about something called Green's Theorem, which is gonna make this game even more fun and even more versatile. But for now, yes, that's correct. Whoops. Okay, so after a lot of preambling and thinking, which is good because this is confusing stuff, let's actually play this game and let me show you what I'm referring to. So we know the integral over the red curve. We want to know the integral over the blue curve. Somehow we have to relate these. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna introduce other line segments. Or they don't have to be line, they can be anything. But you know, maybe I'll add a line here. Let me call this L1. And then I'll add a line here and I'll call it L2.
And maybe let me move this picture down here. Do we just make up the orientation? Yep, you can pick whatever you want. Um, you could change the orders, you can make them go, it literally doesn't matter. You can play the game no matter what the curves look like. And can we just use one line? Um, no, probably no. Because we're gonna need, we want, so the goal here, maybe let me write this down. The goal is to use this, but in particular, our strategy is find loops in simply connected domains. And like, a, this is the important point, we are not allowed to use the origin. So the brown point is not there. So if you only had one line, you wouldn't really be able to find a loop in a simply connected domain. So in this case, you would need to. Okay, and then do we also have to use this method if the circle was smaller than the square? Yeah, so we you, the same method would work. That's what I was saying is like earlier, like I picked a circle bigger than the square, but it didn't have to be. I could have picked this smaller circle and it, it'll work the same. So let's do it, and I think it'll clear up why it doesn't really matter what, what things you pick. So this is what I'm gonna call L1 and L2. And to give some other names to things, these lines kind of divide up the curves nicely. So for example, I have this half of the curve. I'm gonna call that C2 plus. And then the left half of the curve, I'm gonna call this C2 minus. And likewise with the blue curves. So the right, so the whole blue curve is C. Let me call the right half C plus and the left half C minus. So I'm just giving names to different pieces. The reason I'm doing that is because here is a closed loop. So I got a private question, which is what difference would it make if we chose the orientation to be counterclockwise? Um, and then Eric asked the question, okay, so let me say this. So I've gotten a lot of great questions and I think I think it will, I think if we do the problem, it will answer a lot of these problems. In particular, like the question about how would things change if I picked a different orientation or like why does this work? Or like, why are we allowed to do this? Let's do it and then see if that clears up what's happening and then we can talk about some questions afterwards. But I think a lot of these questions might become a little more clear <laughs> once I finally start actually doing this. I keep getting, keep getting halted by questions, which is good. But anyway, the reason I wanna do this is because I'm gonna show you a closed loop. Let's go like this. So I'll highlight the loop I care about in green. And I need to be careful about the order that the green loop is traveling in. There's a closed loop. Maybe let me call this, I don't know, A. So I'll use some color coordination. If everyone's on board with what I just did there. A is this highlighted green loop. Now, what do we know about the integral of f over a? It's zero, correct. Um, because of this fact, but we still have some work to do. 
So what we need to do is identify a simply connected domain which contains this loop. And I'll, I'll do that by just doing some color coordination again. So instead of drawing something or writing down something specifically, which you could definitely do, I'm just going to be lazy right now and I'll just show you a domain. So we could take, yeah, so if we took X strictly bigger than zero, we'd be missing out on like this specific purple part. But yeah, we could take, for example, X bigger than or equal to zero, but then not the origin. Um, let, let's do that. Let D A be the set where X is bigger than zero, but then remove the origin. And let me kind of color that in. That would look something like this. I'll color code it again. Um, yeah, so Ricardo's got it. So the curl of F is zero. The domain I just wrote down, DA, is simply connected. So by what I wrote before, F is conservative on this domain. And therefore, since this is a closed loop, it integrates to zero. Um, and then Matthew's got a good question, which I'll talk about in a second. Let me write down the punchline now. Um, so since um, DA is simply connected, uh, and contains A, by path independence, or I don't know, God. A being a closed loop implies together with this fact up here that the integral of F, <laughs> uh -huh. I'm losing my mind. The integral of F around A is zero. Okay, so Matthew has a formatting question. Since you may not have access to all these colors, that's a very great question. Um, should we bold our, so I'll, I mean, I'll say that you don't have to do any kind of color coordinating at all. I'm mostly doing it just so that you can, hopefully it's helpful in terms of understanding things. But if you just write like this, or if you wrote in words like let DA be, the set blah 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 or something like that or even if you just like drew in a blob and did something like that i would be fine with that um, yeah so if, if you want to lightly shade it and refer to it as a shaded region i would be fine with that um, but it's a good question but as usual with kind of formatting type issues i'll say it's up to you um, you should feel free to do whatever you want as long as it's clear and as long as it's communicating that you kind of know what's going on. But it's a good question if you don't have color access like this. Now the other important thing to do here is we need to write down what A is in terms of all of these pieces. So I got a private question, which was, in this type of problem, do we usually have to define the curves that make up the closed loop? Probably, yeah. You'll probably have to pick the curves. And then I got another private question, which was, does conservative mean that the particle ends up at the same place that it starts? So if I fill in a bunch of words there for you, um, you could think about what we're doing when we compute this line integral is we're tracking the path of someone hiking on a mountain range. And the fact that we go on a closed loop means that we start and end at the same like part on the mountain. 
That's sort of one way to think about it. Okay, and then, thank you. There's the, curve. it'll be L1. So yeah, let's do this actually. I follow L1 in the correct direction. And then I follow C plus in the correct direction. And then I follow L2 in the correct direction. And then I follow C2 plus in the opposite direction. So I would pick up a negative C2 plus. And there's A. So I know you guys are complaining about the clockwise, but it, it really doesn't change anything. And I would not bank on this kind of thing happening in general. It just changes pluses and minus signs. And it doesn't, it doesn't really matter at all. Okay, question about the notation. When do we have to put the little arrow? So that's another kind of similar thing is with the integral sign, you don't have to. I do usually if it's a vector quantity to kind of indicate that it is a vector quantity, but you don't have to. As long as it's clear what notation, what your notation means, I think it's fine. Okay. Any questions about that? I'm about to do the same exact thing with the left half of this figure. And guess what I'll call it? Surprise. Let's call it B. Let me copy my picture first real quick. Let's go with this orangey color. And yeah, I'll do the same thing. Like I could instead follow this kind of path. So let B be um, the closed loop in the peachy color. That's what it looks like to me at least. I'm gonna call it peach. Thank you. There's so let me record what B is in terms of our curve arithmetic. It's L1 minus C minus plus L2 plus C2 minus. And same exact thing as before. I'm gonna conclude that the integral is zero because I can place this curve in a simply connected domain. So maybe let me let DB be the set X less than or equal to zero minus the origin. And I'll color that in again, maybe in gold. So that would kind of look like this. Um, and same exact argument is up here. And then I got a question, I'll look at that in a second. So DB, this is simply connected. It contains our loop B. B is a closed loop. And earlier we remarked that F is conservative on simply connected domains. And so therefore we can conclude that the integral over B is zero. Okay, so I got a private question, which was how could we write let A B and let B be in words on a test? Um, Yeah, so I, I think a lot. Um, okay, I don't know what I was saying. 
but I mean, one, so maybe one comment I'll make is that if you don't have this like color coordination at your disposal, you don't have to write this. Like if you just say, let A be this, it is very clear what you're referring to. Um, yeah, and then Alfred's got the, the next idea. Um, also, let me... It's kind of weird not being able to see my face. I don't know if it's weird for you guys. I forget what I was. Oh, yeah, I was saying that, like, if you just in the test, if you say let A be this, that's fine. Like, what do I mean by this? If you say let A be this, if you have a picture like this, it's clear what you mean. Yeah, vibe changed up. We can come back to the vibe sometime. <laughs> but I want you to be able to see my facial expressions. That sounds weird, but teaching is like a, it's more than just watching words on the screen. Okay. Right, so what's the point? We found these two closed loops and we've concluded that the integrals over them are zero. What good does that do us? Let's think about like 45 minutes ago, what was the goal of this problem? The goal is to figure out some integral over C, right? Well, what is C? It's C plus plus C minus. That's our end goal, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm doing my best. We can only do so much. Okay. So the point here is I want us to look at this expression and this expression and just think about like elementary school math. What could you do to generate C plus plus C minus? Thanks, Elijah. Savior is maybe too strong of a word, but I'll take the compliment. So if we were back in fourth grade and I said, do something to give me C1 or C plus plus C minus, exactly, we could take, um, right, right. Here's a C plus, here's a negative C minus. So if I took this expression minus this expression, this thing would pop out. So let me just do that. Note that A minus B is, now I've mentioned this before, but one of the things that I will miss about going back to a chalkboard is not being able to copy and paste. That feature is pretty good. Okay, there's A minus B. Let's simplify things. What happens? Well, we get um, kind of like we wanted C plus plus C minus. That's C. And so the question is, could we also go along the opposite path for A or B? Yes. So a couple of the questions earlier, which is like, how do things change if we picked different orientations? Or excuse me, or if like, what if I picked instead of going this way, what if I went the other way? Everything works out the same. So I wouldn't worry about choices like this, they don't matter. The only thing that will change is like what you write here. That's the only part that'll change and then you'll just have to figure out exactly what you want. So it might look like B minus A or like A plus B, it kind of depends, but yeah. Orientation doesn't really matter here at all. 
Um, so then I got a couple questions, which were, why am I subtracting again? So let me, yeah, let me write that down. Um, so the goal here is to get something about C, right? If we scroll way, 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 way back up here, the whole thing that we're trying to compute is the integral over C. So I'm thinking somehow I need to get something that looks like C minus plus C plus, because that's what C is. Um, so then I looked at this expression and this expression, and I saw a C plus here and a C minus, a negative C minus here. And so I, re I realized that if I take A minus B, I'll get a C plus plus C minus. And indeed we do. So then what else do we get? Well, we've got a um, negative C2 plus minus C2 minus. What is that? That's negative C2. And then what happens? L1 minus L1, L2 minus L2, they go away. So A minus B is C minus C2. And finally, we're almost done. <laughs> What's the point? What we've just concluded is that the integral over A minus B um, okay, so I got a couple questions. A private question was, can we use path independence and only keep n points? Or do we have to say that the integral is zero? Integral of the loop is zero. Those are saying the same thing to me. So I don't know if I entirely understand the question, but the fact that like closed loops integrate to zero, um, that's, that's what path independence says, roughly. Um, and then why is C2 negative? Yeah, because here I had a negative C2 plus, and then this negative sign distributes onto this. So I end up with minus C2 plus, minus C2 minus. That's, yeah, thanks. So that gives us minus C2. Anyway, so what this computation shows is that the integral over A minus B is the same thing as the integral over C minus C2. And then the point is, is we can split these up. And the other point is we can also split these up. And the whole point of doing all of this is that we know what both of these are. These are both zero. Um, so then why do the L's cancel out, but not the C's? So the probably the not helpful answer that you weren't really asking for is, it's just because of the algebra. Like if you subtract these expressions, like it just works that way. The moral answer is that the L's are just a tool for us and they don't really live in the world. We kind of just introduce them to play this game. Um, and then they, they end up going away. Um, so then I got a private question, which was, would B minus A also work? Yes, that would. Yep, at this point, it doesn't seem like it, but at this point, it's just basic algebra. So, you know. A minus B is the same thing as B minus A up to, up to multiplication by a negative sign. So look what we have, and we'll finish this off finally. Zero equals this.
And earlier, we computed the integral of C2 over C2. So what we have doing some algebra is that the integral over C is the integral over C2, which we computed earlier is negative two pi. And finally, we finished it off. It's a doozy. Ooh, okay. There's a lot that just happened in the, let me make a few comments and then I'll ask if there are questions and then we can move on. Um, this, this is not, <laughs> this won't be helpful at all for me to say. So I don't even know I'm saying it, but I'm going to say it anyway. This kind of thing that we just did here, I think, looks a lot harder <laughs> than it actually is. Again, I, I know that that's not helpful at all to say, but the only reason I say that is, is so if you get something like this tomorrow or in four hours or whatever, don't get overwhelmed by the notation and the letters and all the integral signs and stuff. Like at the core, we're using this fact right here this is kind of the key of all of this, together with some basic arithmetic. So the, the soul of the problem is just setting up basic arithmetic equations and manipulating them to get what you want. And the mechanism by which you do that with is this fact right here. But it's kind of fun. I think it's really cool. And the point is, is exactly that, like, if you get a weird curve like this that you can't do directly, just pick a simpler curve, use path independence to your advantage. So that's, that's one not helpful comment I'll make. Um, another comment I'll make is if you're so confused about what happened here, um, I did post a video this morning of a problem very, very similar to this in spirit, where I kind of go through the same explanation. So if you want, you can check out that video. Um, and I got a private question about midterm two, question four, which is pretty much the same thing we're doing now. Eventually we can, I'm gonna spice it up a little bit, um, just for the sake of variety. But yeah, we can come back to that if I'm not too tired by the end. Okay, and then do we have, do I have general hints on the order of ways to approach a problem? Um, so, I, I um, this is a good question, Kelly. Um, it's kind of a, a very hard question to answer in general, and I'll give you a non-helpful answer, but maybe something to keep in mind, maybe while you watch the rest of this or whatever. But usually when I, so usually that kind of thing, like do I have hints on how to approach the problem? Usually I try to do this kind of thing in every example. I always start out with these stupid thought bubbles, right? And this is me thinking exactly about that stuff. So if you want, you can kind of go back and look at notes or look at, um, look at videos or look at other things I've done. And usually if I have tips like that, like, oh, you know, um, stuff like this or whatever, usually I mention those kind of things at the beginning. But so I do, but it's kind of, I don't know, hard to say in general. So I'm only confused on what happened at the end. Um, so the, so why is the integral of C, right? So what I highlighted in the bluish color here is an equality. This expression equals zero. That was the main conclusion here. So if this minus this equals zero, then again, if you 
you know, if I renamed these things, smiley face and frowny face, and we went back to, oh yeah, it's all good. The notation makes things hard to look at. Like it sounds silly, but notation can be confusing. So that's fine. Okay, will I upload this recording today? Maybe, don't be sorry. Um, I don't know, we'll see. It depends on what time this ends. It depends on how tired I am because it does take a non-trivial amount of time to upload like a potentially four hour video to YouTube. So it might go up tomorrow morning at the latest, but we'll see. Okay, any other questions about this one? Noah seems to be pretty into this kind of concept. So again, I, I haven't seen the exam. I don't know what it looks like, but if I had to bet, I'm betting something like this is going to be on there. So good to keep in mind. Okay. Let's do something else. Let's do something quick since it's been, yeah. And so the other thing to keep in mind, um, for those of you guys in James's class, in case, in case you haven't realized this yet, the homework, quizzes, and exams are all identical, I think. Um, so, yeah. So I'm pretty sure like the exams that everyone takes tomorrow, they're all gonna look the same. Yeah. Okay, this will be a quick, this will be a quick question after we spent like an hour doing the last question. We need something quick and fun. I really like this one. I like it because it's all about thinking and understanding the concepts <laughs> and not about computing anything. You guys know I like questions like that. So I'll let you guys think about it. Very simple looking question. I, I drew a shitty picture of a vector field. And the question is, is it conservative? I just remembered I have salad left. I'll let people think. Elijah says no. Ricardo says no. Eric says maybe. Okay, so I, I like, um, so people have said no, I agree. Um, you know, the thing I'm gonna ask next is obviously why, or like, can we come up with a decently convincing argument? Um, No, I, I, okay, I didn't think about this, but it's a good thought. And so one of the things that a couple people have mentioned were is roughly something about the curl. So it, it looks like, so someone, Noah said local rotation. And Dylan said, if you drop a ball, it's gonna spin. To me, those are both, excuse me, about the curl. And so I think what you guys are maybe thinking is that it seems like the curl could be non-zero. Um, which would imply that it's not conservative. I'm into that. The, th the thing that you have to be careful about, and this is gonna sound annoying, um, but maybe, Maybe let me try to bring something up for you. And this is an important lesson to learn because the things that you, you have to be careful about thinking about infinitesimal quantities visually. So 
So give me a second here. And now I'm sorry you can't see the picture anymore. Oh, this is so annoying. Maybe let me do this. Someone else has got to wrap this stuff. I really like what Elijah just said though. But let me show you a picture. But that was, that, was, that was a good, really good idea. So thinking about, I think what you guys were identifying is that I know that if the curl is not zero, then the vector field's not conservative. So maybe I can look at this shitty picture I drew and determine like, does it look like the curl is zero? And I think you guys are thinking the right thing. Like one way to think about the curl is, oops, sorry. <laughs> One way to think about the curl is like if you dropped an infinitely small like stick in the vector field, like would it rotate? And yeah, it kind of looks like it would maybe rotate like this. But I, like I said, I, I think you have to be careful about that because measuring infinitesimal quantities visually is can be deceiving. So what I was going to show you is a picture of the vortex field in case you guys, I don't know if you've ever actually graphed it. Oh, I'm not going to click on a Chegg link. I don't like Chegg. Here's a picture that probably looks like it's from a calculus book. Okay. Okay, let's go with this. Here's what the vortex field looks like. Okay. The curl of this vector field is zero. Can you tell that by looking at the picture? Maybe, but it's, so the vector field is not defined at the origin. So everywhere else, um, the curl is zero everywhere, right? We know that about the vortex field. Um, And the only thing I want to point out is that, like, I'm showing you a picture of something where the curl is zero everywhere. And does it look like that? Like, if you dropped a stick, could you tell that it wouldn't rotate? Maybe, maybe not, but it's a little hard. So I do, I do like your guys' idea about the curl, but I think you have to be a little careful. And so I think a preferable answer would be something like what Elijah said, which let me scroll back up to that, is, if I walk in a rectangular path, the amount of force I feel from the field adds up to a non-zero amount since it increases as I get away from the x-axis. That's getting at the right idea. Here's what I would do. Um, I'll show you what my answer would be at least, and it's basically gonna be that, except I'll just say it in math words. Um, Consider the following closed loop. Let me call that C. Okay. And let me break this up into different segments as well. So maybe from here to here, this is like C1. Maybe from here to here, this is like C2. And then maybe from like here to here, this is like C3. Now, and I'll reiterate, this is all very imprecise. So it's an imprecise question, so it'll yield an imprecise answer. And if, 
I don't know if something like this would be on a test, but I think if it were, it would be like a multiple choice type question. So you wouldn't have to try to justify this, but here's why I think it's not conservative. What do you think the line integral over this curve would be intuitively? And in particular, we could think about this carefully if we break it up over these three pieces. Um, this part over C1 is definitely positive. It's like very positive, right? Um, so a good question is like, are C2 and C3 perpendicular to the vector field? Maybe not literally, but cl it looks closer like that. Um, and so question is, can we go over what makes it positive and negative again? Yeah, let me talk about this because this is exactly the point of the question. When we compute a line integral like this, so let's just think about C1. What are we doing when we compute a vector line integral? What we're doing is at every point we're computing the tangent vector and we're comparing the tangent vectors to the vector field. In particular, we're taking the dot product. And so what do I know about all of these dot products? They're gonna be positive and they're gonna be pretty positive. So because of that, I would expect this to be relatively positive. Um, here on the next segment, what do the tangent vectors look like? They're gonna look like this. I think this is what Dara was pointing out that like, maybe not literally perpendicular, but certainly closer to perpendicular. There's, you know, there's a couple things we can say. The dot products here, they look mostly negative, but they're gonna be closer to zero. The other observation is that like these vectors are a lot shorter than the vectors over here. So this one might be negative, but it will be pretty close to zero. So negative, but close to zero. Yes, exactly. So that's exactly the point. And then likewise with C3, if I looked at the tangent vectors, maybe um, marine or something, again, they, they look negative-ish, but the, they look more closer to perpendicular. And the vectors, again, are also smaller over here. So it might be... Um, so again, it's, it's probably negative overall, but it's probably very close to zero. And the whole point is that if you add these up, it seems like based on my incredible picture that the positive contribution from this segment um, is gonna outweigh the very small negative contributions. Um, but Alex's question is good. It, it does matter a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but let me just write this down. Probably, again, this is all vague and imprecise. Probably the positive contribution from C1 outweighs um, But, but I'm gonna come back to Alex's question because I, I have an, another quick question to ask, but let me just write down the punchline. The positive contribution from C1 probably outweighs the small negative contributions from C2 and C3. So again, probably this line integral is not zero 
which would mean f is not conservative. Yeah, so I, what I want is for the positive contribution here to outweigh the total negative contribution here. Roughly the idea is that the vectors are a lot longer up here and they're a lot smaller down here. So it's probably like pretty positive and then small negative. Yeah, that's the idea. So the fact that we found a closed loop which integrates to something zero means f is, again, probably not conservative. Okay, so I got a lot of public and private questions. Let me catch up a little bit and then, I'll, then I want to go back to what Alex said. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, a private question was, how do you know if the dot product is positive or negative? Really quickly, because this is important to know. Um, two vectors look like that, positive dot product. Uh, and if they look like roughly opposite directions, negative. And if they're perpendicular, zero. So that's what the dot product dot product is measuring. Okay. Okay, I got a private question, which was along the same lines as Alex's questions earlier, which was, couldn't I have drawn any shape I wanted? Would every shape that is closed prove this? Not, not necessarily. So this is the, uh, oh, I spoiled my answer. So I'll come back to this. So can I, another private question was, could I quickly explain why the dot product should be negative on C2 and C3? So like if you, if you just look at the vectors, right? Like the tangent vectors for C2 are these purple vectors pointing this way. Um, and the green vectors look, so it looks like roughly an obtuse angle. Um, and likewise here. So that's all I'm identifying. Okay, I got a private question, which is, will this be uploaded tonight? Maybe at the latest by tomorrow morning, but you have the whole weekend to do these in. So at the latest, it'll be up by tomorrow morning. I'll say that. Okay, so then another question was, is it ever possible to get an integral over a closed loop being zero, even though the vector field is not conservative? This is what I wanted to ask. This is what I wanted to go down to. So I was gonna write a true false question, and then I, didn't have time, but here's what I want to say. Um, if F is, and this is roughly what you're asking, and this is, I think, what Alex was getting at, and, and this is what I want to think about. If F is not conservative, and um, and C is a closed loop, on the domain, so on some domain. Then the integral over that curve is non-zero. True or false? Oh yeah, can I scroll back up a little bit? Can I fit? No, I can't do that. Okay, think about this and then I'll scroll back up. And then I got a private question, which was, was the red thing um, oriented clockwise? So maybe I'll scroll back up here. The red thing, it looks like I oriented going this way. Yeah. <laughs> right, and so from, that's correct. So from what I said a couple minutes ago, or from the reason why I wanna talk about this is that this is false. Um, that's correct. Like, if you have a conservative vector field, you could, sorry, that's, that was the wrong thing to say. If you have a vector field, which is not conservative, there could still be a loop out there which integrates to zero, right? So to go back to Alex's question, which is like, did I just pick any random loop? I didn't, I definitely did not. I very specifically picked this loop because I wanted this kind of an argument. Um, 
like there could for sure it's not the case that like any random loop you pick would work you could draw some ridiculous looking loop here that would give you zero and then that would not you couldn't make a conclusion from that so anyway that's the only reason i wanted to talk about this is that this is false um, you could still get zero. The statement is that, well, we haven't really talked about this because it's kind of hard to prove, but, um, <laughs> never mind. So it is not the case that not being conservative implies that every closed loop is not zero. Yeah. Anyway, that was kind of fun. But so I, I do like what you guys were thinking about with the curl. I think you just have to be a little careful there because curl is like an infinitesimal quantity and looks can be deceiving. I think an intended type of solution here would be thinking about finding a closed curve, which is, is non-zero. And so I think that's the idea. It's probably not conservative for that reason. Okay. I want to, oh, that's a fun one. I wanna make sure we talk about spherical coordinates just because it's been a little while. Do I think the midterm will take as long as the homework? Definitely not. Um, okay, so then the question is, so could it, it could be conservative if the loop was different. No, I mean, so if you picked a different loop, you could get an integral of zero, but that would not mean that the vector field was conservative. It would just mean that you found one closed loop, um, which integrates to something non-zero, and that wouldn't tell you anything, right? So could I explain what curl means conceptually? Yeah, let me, let me talk about that again really quick. No, no, then we'll do a spherical coordinate problem. But one way to think about curl is that it's, it's measuring infinitesimal rotation. So I think this is what some of the people were thinking about when I posed this idea. But if you drew, or if you thought about this, this vector field here as representing like the water of something, or like the flow of water, if you threw a stick in that pond, would it rotate? And if so, that's the kind of thing that the curl is measuring. So curl is roughly measuring like infinitely small rotation, whatever that means. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's correct. So this kind of thing, like we could only prove that something is not conservative this way. Like to prove that something's conservative, you wouldn't really want to approach that by finding a bunch of closed loops. Um, exactly. Okay, where was my spherical coordinate question? Oh, it was up here. Just since it's been a while since we've talked about spherical coordinates, let's think about this. Also though, I need a bathroom break. So I'll let you guys think about it. I'll be right back. But also so that I don't leave you empty handed, I have another poll about my ice cream shop. Okay, I'll be back.
All right. This one was a lot closer than the shop names, so that's good. It's good. Don't worry about it. I don't think it's too loud. So gonna, if it is, I can move upstairs, but yeah, don't worry about it. Nice. Okay. I think it would be a very successful business. Okay, spherical coordinate time. Let's see if we can figure this out. Also, um, can you guys hear the washing machine in the background? Is that really annoying? I, I don't know how loud it is. No, okay. All right, good. <laughs> Our laundry room is like, is literally in my room pretty much. It's like right next to my room, so. Yeah, my lawn, my roommate just started doing laundry. Am I gonna do the spherical coordinate dance live? Maybe. Um, maybe not. I will say, stay tuned. I've got something special coming too. So. Okay. So now we've had a break. Actually, let me back up, let me read this. I forget what the question is. Let E be the region satisfying a number of inequalities. Z is bigger than the square root of X squared plus Y squared. X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared is bigger than one. And then that other inequality. <clears throat> and we're supposed to compute some triple integral over this region of Z. And, you know, I'm a little mad at myself for saying, well, let's do a spherical coordinate problem because I spoiled it now and I didn't say anything about spherical coordinates, but I don't think it's maybe super hard to see that that's a good idea just because um, here we have a sphere looking thing. Here we have a sphere. It's not centered at the origin, but we have a couple spheres. And also we have a cone, right? This cuts out a cone. And to me, cones can feel spherical. So the point there is that the region feels spherical to me. Whatever that means, it's just a feeling. And therefore, I think spherical coordinates might be a good idea. Spherical coordinates. Okay, next thing I'll do is I'll draw some pictures. And as usual, just because it's hard to draw things in three dimensions, I'm right now thinking about a potentially helpful side view, right? to make my life easier, but to capture the kind of relevant geometric intuition, side views are usually pretty good. Now, what do I mean by a side view? Well, if I, before I draw anything, if I just think about what's going on, I have a sphere, I have a sphere shifted up, and then I have a cone opening in the Z direction. So mostly because of this cone opening in the Z direction, it seems like looking in either the XZ or the YZ plane seems like it would be a good idea. <sighs> okay, so does Z greater than or equal to this, does this mean we're looking at the inside or outside of the cone? 
I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think it's the inside of the cone. So maybe here's the way you can think about in, inequalities like this. Think about the equality case. So the equality would be this guy. So if I drew that in the XZ plane, it'd probably look like this. And so that's the boundary. And then I want Z to be bigger than this thing. So that tells me that I care about the stuff up here. And I guess that would count as inside the cone. Inside an ice cream cone, one might say. Okay, then we've got this sphere. This is a sphere of radius one centered at the origin, which means it probably looks, <laughs> it's close, something like that. Waffle cone or sugar cone? I don't know. Closed loops and frozen scoops would definitely have both options for sure. So there's the sphere, and then again, this condition tells me that we're gonna care about stuff outside of the sphere. And then finally, we have this other sphere. Now, this is a sphere So this problem might be kind of terrible. <laughs> May have screwed up when I was writing it. That's okay. Let's let's do it anyway. Let's try. Um, a sphere of radius four centered at the point one zero zero one, or a sphere of radius two rather, would look sort of like this. Yikes. I mean, I agree, waffle cones are definitely better, but I feel like you need sugar cones for like kids or something, I don't know. Okay, so what do we know about the region? Well, we're inside the cone, outside of the red sphere, inside of the green sphere. So that's this stuff. Traffic cone. I don't know if I know what that is. Clearly not very knowledgeable about the ice cream world. So I have some learning to do. Oh, unless you were referring to literal traffic cones. I see. But yeah, at closed loops and frozen scoops, we could have like various shapes. Like we could have like cylindrical, um, cylindrical Saturday, and all of the cones would be like cylinders or something. Anyway. Okay, so we need to set this up in spherical coordinates. The region is gonna be described by what? Usually when you think about spherical coordinates, you wanna think about rho first. Let me leave it at that. Let me write this down. So usually think about rho first. So let's see if we can figure out what the bounds for rho are. When we think about doing rho first, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about fixing an angle theta and phi and then integrating along a ray 
from the origin. So when I'm thinking about row, I'm thinking about doing this kind of thing. And when I'm doing this, I'm looking at the picture and I'm trying to identify what thing is determining my lower bound and what thing is determining my upper bound. Well, it looks like the lower bound is being cut out by the red sphere. So the lower bound is determined by um, the red thing, which if I take that equality here, I would get this. And then I want to turn this into a bound for rows, so I'm going to um, turn this equation into spherical coordinates. Well, in spherical coordinates, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is rho squared. So I get this equation. And that means that rho is 1. Because rho, we always think about as being positive. So lower bound for rho is 1. Oops. Upper bound for row, it looks like, is cut out by the green sphere. Damn it. So the upper bound cut out by the green sphere. And this is where things might get kind of silly. So I apologize for writing a silly problem. It's cut out by this, and now that's confusing. So let's turn this into spherical coordinates. Now, how would I do that? Um, usually it's easier to multiply out this squared quantity if you have a shifted sphere like this. So if I multiply out that z minus one, um, we would get z squared minus 2z uh, oh <laughs> okay um, so I'm just gonna admit it I screwed up when I wrote the problem make the 4 a 5 What I was going to do is I was going to make this a two. Yes. I don't like doing this, but hopefully. <laughs> right. So <laughs> what I wanted to have happen was for these constants to cancel out. I don't think you would get anything this, this hairy. So I'm going to use my ultimate power as the person who is running the review session and who wrote all of these questions to retroactively change my question so that this is a sphere centered at zero, zero, two. The picture doesn't change a whole lot. So then what would we get? We would get a four Z here. Again, I apologize for doing that. Sorry if you already tried working it out when I was in the bathroom. You could do, you could do it still. It'll be ugly, but you could do it. Uh, and then <clears throat> we get a plus four now. And then the fours cancel out. That's what I kind of wanted to have happen. Can you really not hear the washing machine? It's so loud. Okay, so then turn it into spherical coordinates and we get rho squared. Um, <laughs> it's going wild right now. I have no clue what's happening in there. If it ever gets distracting, let me know. I'm a little scared.
I yeah, I don't know. We might move upstairs. Anyway, we get rho squared here minus four times z. Well, in spherical coordinates, z is rho cosine phi. And again, what were we doing? We were trying to find a bound for rho, so I just do some algebra here and solve for rho. I could move the four cosine, four rho cosine phi to the other side, divide by rho, and this will tell me that rho is gonna be um, four cosine phi. <laughs> I don't think it's anything he put in there. I think it's the washing machine itself, which I guess isn't so good. Anyway, there's our upper bound. Okay, now we can move on to um, phi and theta. Let's do theta just because it's easy. What do you think? Okay, it just stopped going wild. Yep, I agree. I think the zero to two pi is good. Bounds for theta. I don't think we need to write a whole lot here. Um, you know, if I think about this shape, it's like, you know, it's going all the way around. So I want to go all the way around like this, zero to two pi. And then for phi, Do we not have to square root rho? Ah, so what I what I did here that maybe I should have written out is I divided both sides by one of the rows, and then the this one went away. Yeah. So how? Okay. So let me let me talk about this a little more precisely. How do we know that the bounds for theta are zero to two pi? Here's maybe instead of me just going like this, which is obviously extremely insightful. Let me draw a picture. And the picture that you wanna draw when you think about theta roughly is what is the projection of the region in the x, y plane? Yeah, exactly, thanks David. Um, and you know, if you, if you think about projecting this region in the x, y plane, you kind of have to be thinking about the whole three-dimensional shape, but if you squash it onto the x, y plane, you would, you would probably see the thing you would see would be like the image of the cap here, if that makes sense. And so you'd get some squashy thing that looks like that. And so now I'm thinking about in the XY plane, like what do I need? <laughs> what do I need to do with theta? We need to go all the way around from zero to two pi. No dancing for now, but maybe, maybe later. I need to start like a, I don't, I don't know. TikTok or like some kind of thing where it's like if you if you donate a dollar each like then I'll do the dance live like I could just you know only fans yeah that's what I need or a patreon I still need to get around to making a patreon <laughs> okay bounds for fee let's not think about that up in the picture here, this is where the side view comes in handy. I want to think about starting at the positive z axis. And I want to go this way. And it looks like because I contain the positive z axis, the lower bound for phi is going to be zero. Yeah, and so I think Amon beat me to it. He says pi over four is going to be the upper bound. 
the point being is we contain the z-axis, so lower bound is going to be zero, and then the upper bound is determined by the cone equation. Um, so lower bound is zero. because the region contains the positive z-axis. Upper bound is determined by the cone. So what could we do? We could do the same thing that we always do in these problems. And once we visually identify the relevant algebraic information, we take that algebraic information and turn it into spherical coordinates. So if I did that here, um, Z again is rho cosine phi. <clears throat> and I get the square root of X squared plus Y squared is R squared. Um, Oh, so we should get rho squared sine squared phi. If you work it out, that's what you'd get. Then we can simplify again. Rho is always positive and sine of phi is always positive because phi ranges from zero to pi. So I can take a square root on the right hand side without worrying about anything. I get that. Cancel out the rows, and then we can see where the pi over four is coming from. So there's the upper bound. Okay, then we can finally set this up. Took long enough. Um, so, <laughs> And I might cop out, it'd be too lazy to actually do it. I don't think it's too bad. So, um, so question was, how would I determine phi if the positive z axis isn't part of the region? I would determine it in, um, I would determine it in roughly the same way that I found the upper bound here, in that it would really depend on what the region looks like, right? So if you didn't contain the z-axis, presumably you'd have some, you know, some other thing here, and it would be like this. And then whatever this thing looked like, you could say like, oh, this is gonna determine the lower bound. So then you would take that algebraic equation, turn it into spherical coordinates, um, go from there, etc. And then, um, yeah. Oh, I missed it. Is that cosine of four? No, it's a phi. Thanks. Yeah. So I think Noah draws his fees like this, maybe. I draw them like this. Maybe that'll be the next poll. Which phi is better? Anyway, the integral that we wanted is z dv. So we can convert this into spherical coordinates. Bounds for rho were, one was the lower bound, four cosine phi is the upper bound. <clears throat> Maybe let me pick an order. We'll do rho, theta, and then phi. Theta we decided was zero to two pi. And then phi was zero to pi over four. Now the integrand is z. When I turn z into spherical coordinates, I get rho cosine phi. So that's coming from here. And then the last thing we need to worry about is the Jacobian, which for a spherical coordinate transformation is rho squared um, sine phi, I think. 
And so that's the fun part. From there, it's just a matter of integrating. I don't really feel like doing it. Um, but it's, it's not so bad. It's pretty straightforward, I think. So maybe I'll stop there if that's okay. Any questions about that? A nice refresher on spherical coordinates. Again, to, to re-describe the general process here for setting up any kind of integral ever, whether it's in spherical coordinates or polar or Cartesian or cylindrical, you draw a decent picture, visually identify the relevant algebraic bounds, and then algebraically get the bounds from that. That's the general description of this strategy. <clears throat> okay, so question is, if the cone was upside down, would the fee bounds be the same? Um, the answer is no. So if the cone looked like this washing machine is If I just die one day, you know what happens. If the cone looked like this, oh, that was bad. That was also bad. That was, that was also bad. Not a great angle to be writing it. So if the cone looked like this, and I'm assuming what you mean by that is like the region would maybe look something like that approximately. Um, the lower bound for phi would be determined by the cone, and the upper bound would be determined by the z-axis, which in this case would be pi. The negative z-axis would be pi. So the, the bounds in this case would look like probably 3 pi over 4 to pi. So that definitely would change the phi bounds. Um, Okay, then I got a private, well, so I got some questions about centroids. Yeah, we do that if you want. Um, and then a private question was, how did I know that the base of the cone wasn't below the larger sphere? Because there is no base of the cone, if that makes sense. So the sphere keeps, or sorry, the cone just goes, goes like that forever and ever and ever and ever. Okay, yeah, we could do a center of mass problem at some point if you want. Um, just for the sake of time, I'd like to talk about some of the more interesting stuff because, so maybe let me say, and this sounds a little, it always sounds a little demeaning every time I say it, but center of mass or centroid problems, conceptually there's nothing there. If you get a problem which says find the center of mass, all that means is compute these triple integrals or double integrals or whatever. So conceptually, there's there's nothing new there at all. It's just it's just an interpretation of certain triple integrals. So it's mathematically a center of mass problem is just a triple integral problem. We can do that, but I think I again until before I get too exhausted. I want to make sure we talk about some other stuff. Let's do this one. I want to. I want. I wanted to make sure I hit a couple main things. I do have a flow line question. Okay. So really quickly. Um, I want to do this example next. I'll pull it up. I got a quick question to address the difference between um, dr and ds for vector line integrals. So maybe let me write this down. Vector line integral versus scalar line integral. Um, in a vector line integral, when you compute dr, 
this is going to be the vector r prime of t. And it's just the honest vector. Um, oh, I, so I think I misinterpreted the question. I'll just continue writing what I was going to write anyway. But it's, it's the same. Anyway, so for ds, um, for a scalar line integral, you take the magnitude of r prime times dt. That's what ds means, and that's always what it means forever until the end of your life. Um, so for example, what's a little confusing is that a vector line integral, it is a scalar line integral, right? This is the thing you have to be a little bit careful about, but this is just a kind of scalar line integral. And in particular, it's defined to be the scalar line integral of yeah, it's defined to be the scalar line integral of f dot capital T, where capital T is the unit tangent vector. And it turns out that it's just equivalent to compute this kind of thing. But this is this is the main thing I think about. Okay. On to this next example. Here's what I want to do. We have a vector field. It's a mess. It's a bunch of stuff. Part A, I want to find the largest possible domain for f. I think we can do that. And then find a potential function for f on that domain. So I wanted to make sure that we went through the process of finding a potential function just because this is likely something that will come up. And we can talk about how to approach it methodically. But we want to find a potential function and then part B is to evaluate um, <laughs> uh, looks like I forgot to finish writing what part B is. So let C be some curve. And then what you were supposed to do is evaluate evaluate the line integral. I forgot to write that part. But before we worry about that, let's, let's go through this process of methodically finding a potential function. So I, I will say, um, if you can eyeball what the potential function is, I think that's fine. So like you could just say, this is the potential function. I'm going to prove to you that it is a potential function. But sometimes that can be hard. So it's good to, it's good excuse me, it's good to see like a methodical process for finding a potential function. So that's what we can go through. But before we do that, maybe my question for you guys, um, <clears throat> what is the domain? What's the largest possible domain? And then I got a couple questions, which was, um, does a potential function have any meaning other than um, proving a vector field is conservative Oh yeah, sorry if you can't see F. Yeah, sorry about that. If anything's too small, let me know. I'll blow it up a bit. Um, so does having a potential function, does this mean anything other than proving a vector field is conservative? Um, I mean, it does, but it, it does in the sense that like, what does that mean? It just means that your vector field is the gradient of some function. And, you know, in 32A, we learned a whole lot about how to interpret what gradients mean and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of meaning you can garner from that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if that's, do we ever use the potential function? Um, we will in part B. Yeah, like for example, you could use it in the um, use it in the fundamental theorem. Let me 
let me do this. Now you don't have to squint. I'm still waiting for the domain as well. But yeah, I mean, so you'd use it in the fundamental theorem. Um, again, I think it has a lot of meaning. So that's a, a possible domain answer. I don't know if I quite agree with that. Those two points are certainly not allowed but I think we need to be a little more restrictive, but you, you're thinking about the correct thing. Um, but maybe to go back, uh, Ninamon had a question, I'll go back and look at that. But to go back to Elijah's question about what does a potential function mean? Again, I don't know if this is the kind of thing you're looking for. And I. I don't really like saying like, oh, go watch this video I made, but then the video about conservative vector fields, I spent like the first maybe 10 or 15 minutes though, I kind of talk about what the potential function looks like and how it interacts with everything. So you can check that out if you want. Okay, so another question was, if you find a potential function, does that automatically mean that F is conservative or can the potential function's domain affect the conclusion? So that's a good question. and. The answer is yes, and so the precise answer is that if you find a potential function, you have proven that the vector field is conservative on the domain of the potential function. That's correct. If that clears things up. Okay, we're getting closer. Uh, Ricardo said all numbers except when y minus x squared times z is zero. What if that quantity is negative? That's also an issue, right? But besides that, boom, there you go. So the domain, largest possible domain, whoops. Would be this, and this maybe isn't very satisfying to like what does this look like I don't know but who cares it's the set of all points and the only restriction that we need is that the thing inside the square root uh, this should be positive again what does that look like I don't know but we don't have to figure out what it looks like okay there's the domain now the more interesting part is to find a potential function so next, let's do that. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think you got it. But like I said, I do want to go through this process um, just to show for people who can't eyeball it. Um, how to go about determining this because you could get something which is like pretty complicated and hard to eyeball. So here's the way you wanna do this. We're looking for, what does it mean to find a potential function? We want a function f such that the gradient of f is this vector field. That's just what that means. That's what it means to be a potential function. Okay, so what would that mean? That would mean that the x derivative of f would have to be this stuff, right? That would have to be the x derivative. And likewise with all the other components. <clears throat> so the y derivative would have to be this thing. And the z derivative would have to be the other thing. Oh 
no, thanks. Yeah, it did. Good catch. I don't know why that happens. All right, back in business. Yeah, our Wi Fi is. Um, no, I don't want to do that. No. Sorry. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry, hold on. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, our Wi-Fi is, is crispy fries. I don't know why, I don't know where that came from. Anyway, I think all you missed is that I said that X derivative has to be this, the Y derivative has to be this, and then I was gonna say that the Z derivative has to be this. This is just exactly what it means to be a potential function. Come on. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. Okay. Again, what I wanted to say is if we can't eyeball what the potential function is, here's the methodical way to go about finding a potential function. Um, start with one of the equations and partially integrate. So let's do that. So I'm gonna take this first equation and I'll think, what does this tell me? Well, if, well, the, so the point is, is that F has to be the X integral of the X derivative, right? Like if the X derivative of F is this thing, then if you integrate that with respect to X, you have to get F. So let's just do the integral. Um, so this first term here, integrating with respect to x, the y's are constant, so that's easy. So an antiderivative here would be e to the x y squared divided by y squared. So that would cancel out the y squared and we would just get e to the x y squared plus, and what about, what about this? So I have to do, um, I can't do this in my head, so I have to do a U sub, probably call the denominator, that, or probably call the stuff inside the square root U, then DU is gonna be negative two x z dx. So x z dx is negative, is negative one half du. So this turns into negative one half one over root u du, which is gonna be, that's like u to the negative one half. So increase it to one half and divide by one half is like multiplying by two. So in the end, if I did all that correctly, I think we get minus the square root of u, which is the square root of this stuff. Um, and Plus, and then really quickly, so yeah, this is what I was talking about earlier, is that if you can just guess the potential function, um, as long as you demonstrate that it is in fact a potential function, I think that's okay. It's so like if you just pull something out of somewhere and you say, I claim that this is the potential function, 
let me show you take the derivatives and if it works out then you're in business yeah so you don't have to do this um, stuff if you don't want to but yeah anyway what's the point this is an integral with respect to x we have to add a constant but that constant could depend on y and z but up to that constant here's f like f has to look like this we just need to figure out what this constant might need to look like okay <laughs> So then what? The methodical way to go about doing this is now that we've used one of these equations, we move on to the second equation. So what do I mean by that? On the one hand, the y derivative of f has to look like this. Right? But on the other hand, we could just take the y derivative of this expression. And if we do that, we would get, so that e term, we would get um, 2xy times e to the xy squared. And then when I take the derivative of this term, this would give us, so this is like blah, blah, blah to the one half. Um, so by the power rule, I'd get negative one half, blah, 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 to the negative one half. Excuse me. And then times the y derivative of the inside, which is just one. So I guess I didn't need much more room. And then we take the y derivative of the constant. So I get that. Okay, so what does this tell me? Well, I get a new equation. And sort of unsurprisingly, a lot of stuff cancels out, right? Boom, 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 boom. So what this tells me is that k of the y derivative of k should be zero. What does this tell me? This tells me that k is only a function of z, right? So k is actually only a z function. So we've reduced further as to what f needs to look like. So f looks like, again, I'm just taking what I have up here. It has to look like, um, e to the x, y squared minus root y minus x squared z plus k, which we've now determined is only a constant, is only at most a function of z. So we're closer. And then I move on to the third equation and I do the same thing. So on the one hand, next, the z derivative of f has to look like this thing up here. But on the other hand, here's f, f has to look like this, so we could just take the z derivative. So before I do that, I got a private question, which was why was the k thing originally a function of y and z? Whoops. And it was because this first integral that I did was with respect to x. 
So, you know, every time you integrate with respect to something, you have to, and anytime you anti-differentiate, you need to add a constant. But with respect to x, y and z are constants. So, you know, we don't know, but the constant could be a function of y and z. So that was because I was integrating with respect to x. So from the gradient condition, the z derivative has to look like that. But then again, on the other hand, we could just take the z derivative here. Well, if I do that, the first term is 0. And then in the second term, we'll get negative 1 half blah, blah, blah again to the negative. Sorry, I screwed up and no one yelled at me. This is a plus 1 half. Plus negative one half and then times the derivative of the inside with respect to z is negative two xz. Nope, it's negative x squared. Uh-oh, starting to go off the rails. I'll try to keep it together. Sorry, I'm really losing it now. Plus the z derivative of this term, which is just going to be k prime. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do five hours tonight. For the final, for the final, I'll go for six. I'll go for a new record there. I want to do six for a final but not tonight. Also, if I do that, none of you should stay for six hours. So I, I almost don't want to do that. Um, okay, so I got a private question, which was, couldn't you integrate all the functions and assign each one an unknown function? Yes, you could do that too. So there's, you know, you could do a bunch of different things. If that makes more sense to you, go for it. Um, this is usually what makes the most sense to me. And then again, the idea here is that these are the same, unsurprisingly, so they cancel out. And what this tells us is that k prime is zero. So actually this function doesn't, um, <laughs> I got a private message which was, I'm sorry, but six hours of math sounds terrible, even with you. I agree. Um, like I said, if if I do a six hour final review session, none of none of you should stay the whole time for that. I'll probably just be spouting gibberish by the end anyway. I got another private question, which is why did I take the z derivative of f and previously I took the y derivative of f? Um, because I'm trying to, that's a good question. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to methodic, and it doesn't really look like it. The notes look a little disastrous, but I'm, I'm methodically working through each of these equations to glean information from them. I should have organized this a little better. So for that, I'm, I apologize, but what's roughly the structure of what I'm doing right now is I started with this block and I figured out what that told me. And then I said, okay, this block is done. So then I moved on to this block and this block tells me something about the Y derivative. So that's why I had to take the Y derivative. And then we did that and got some more information. And so now I'm onto this block and this block says, take the Z derivative. So that's what I'm doing. So that's kind of why I'm, I'm taking each of these derivatives. Anyway, the fact that k prime of z is zero means that k actually doesn't depend on z either. So k also doesn't depend on z.
so we could take k to be an honest constant. Um, in particular, we could pick it to be zero. So the question is, why is the one half positive on the left, but on the right it's negative? There's a negative sign hiding right there. And I'm, I was too lazy to simplify things. Um, what did I say? Oh yeah, so we could take k to be zero. Because when we're picking a potential function, honest constants don't matter at all. And there we go. And I think this is what was suggested earlier in the chat, but we've methodically figured it out. We could take, let me write this down. So f equals e to the x, y squared minus this square root thing. That's a potential function. Is a potential function on the domain that we specified earlier. <laughs> Did I call the domain D? No, I didn't. I'll call it D up here. Um, okay, so no dishonest constants, that's funny stuff. I got a private question, which was, could you also find a potential function? Yeah, yeah, so, oh, that was asked privately earlier also, but yeah, so the question is, could we alternatively integrate each of these expressions, like with respect to their own variables, and then, and then I got a, a third private question, I think, asking about the same thing. Um, so the question is, can I integrate this with respect to x, and then separately integrate this with respect to y, and then this with, this with respect to z, and then match things up? That would work. That's essentially the exact same thing as what's going on here. Yeah. That would work. You could do that. Could you have found this by eyeballing, or so how, how could you have found this by eyeballing it from the beginning? I, I, I don't know if I could have. Um, I think so for the people that, um, for the people that can eyeball this, probably what they're doing is they're doing this partial integration just in their head without working through all the nitty gritty details. And maybe they can just see that like, oh yeah, like you get something like this. Can I do that? Not really, I don't think so. So if the question was, how can Joe eyeball it? I can't, <laughs> so this is what I would do. Um, but if you can kind of see things in your head, yeah, and so maybe, maybe this one's pretty easy to eyeball, it depends. But for the whole eyeballing thing, like you do kind of just have to be able to look at it and roughly integrate things to see what, what you get out. Okay. Anyway, however you go about doing it, do your own thing. Like I said, you can do whatever you want as long as whatever you do shows that it is a potential function. Then there are various ways to communicate that fact. Now that's part A. Part B is we have some curve here and we're supposed to evaluate the line integral over that curve. <sighs> what do you think we're going to do? Um, so the question is, so eyeballing it, so like in my solution, if I eyeballed it, I would have to take the partial derivatives to demonstrate that it is a potential function, correct? 
and but so if we do this like partial integration stuff do i have to demonstrate at the end that it's a potential function um i don't think so i think to me if if you did this like this is kind of the equivalent work to demonstrating that it's a potential function and then i got a private question which was why did we need to find the domain because when I wrote the question, I said, <laughs> find the largest possible domain. Um, <laughs> that's a non-answer, but I mean, probably in a question like this, like the point of a question would be something like, is the vector field conservative? That's kind of what the question is getting at. And the point is, is like anytime we talk about something being conservative, you need to talk about a domain. So anytime you, if you ever say like blah, blah, blah is conservative, you should always, always specify a domain. So that's, that's all I was giving you. Anyway, how do we go about evaluating this line integral? What do you guys think? Yeah, so this is exactly the point. Like in part A, we found a potential function. So what does that mean? It means that on this domain, the vector field's conservative. So to compute the line integral, like rather than computing it directly, which, I mean, if you want, you could try, but it seems hard because this looks wild. <laughs> and like if X and Y are cosine squared and sine squared, things are gonna look gnarly up here. So doing it directly doesn't seem like such a good idea, but since we found a potential function, um, yeah, so I got some public and private answers, which are we could instead use the fundamental theorem of conservative vector fields. That's exactly what we'll do. So I'll do this quickly. So by part A, F is conservative on D. So by the fundamental theorem of conservative vector fields, um, This line integral that we care about all we need to do yeah damn it screen froze again why is it doing this there we go sorry about that <laughs> yeah everything's Yeah, the iPad's tired. I'm getting tired too. Uh, all right, we were using the fundamental theorem. So the fundamental theorem says that all we have to do is plug in the endpoints of the path, which right, we can figure them out in a second, but the parameter domain was from zero to two pi. So we would plug in whatever r of two pi is into little f and then subtract whatever r of zero is. And that'll be it, that's all we have to do. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's figure out what that is. So let me remind you what the parameterization is. See if I remember, I think it was cosine squared, sine squared, T. Negative T. So R of two pi, cosine of two pi is one. So this will be the point one, sine of two pi is zero, and then negative two pi minus F of zero, uh, cosine of T is
one, zero, and zero. All right. So f of one zero two pi is one zero negative two pi. It's going to be e to the zero is one minus the square root of two pi minus e to the zero again is one minus the square root of zero which is zero one minus one is zero so i think we get negative root two pi yay Cool. Okay, so the, the summary of that problem was what? Um, we have a vector field. We found a potential function which Im implied, I mean, that's the definition of what it means to be conservative. And once we knew that the vector field was conservative, to evaluate a line integral, we can just use the potential function. We can use the fundamental theorem, and we don't have to do any integration. Um, we can just plug in endpoints into the potential function. Good stuff. So we can use the fundamental theorem. Yes, this is a good question. Um, so I think the question, or I don't, I don't know what the question is, but here I literally use the fundamental theorem. But then if you think about, for example, a problem like question six in the homework, 6C specifically, you used the fact that the vector field was conservative, but you didn't end up using the fundamental theorem literally because it was hard to find the potential function. So the alternative kind of strategy that you could use is, well, if I can figure out that the vector field is conservative by some other means, if I can't find a potential function, I could instead use path independence and maybe pick a simpler path to integrate over. Why is it negative? I don't know. Should it be positive? Um, so I think, I think this negative sign's right. So the negative sign's coming from roughly from there. Okay, so I got a great question, which is privately, which is, do you have to check that the parameterized curve is defined on the domain? Um, so that is something to worry about, but maybe what I would say is if and this is something for whoever's writing the problem to worry about. Yeah, you're right. I don't know what's happening with the signs here. I'm not too worried about it. This could be a plus or it could be a minus. I probably screwed up somewhere. So you can check if you want. Um, up to a possible plus or minus sign. Yeah. I like that answer. The process was right, so the answer doesn't matter. I'm not too thrilled with my work here. Ideally, it would be a little neater, but that's correct. That like, if you're doing this and you have a well-written organized solution, if you do what I did and somewhere make a sign mistake, like if, 
if it's easy to catch or if it's if it's clearly described then it's probably fine uh, i was saying something and i completely forget oh right uh, the private question was about the domain of the curve um what I was saying is that that's, that should be something for the person writing the problem to worry about because if the domain wasn't in the, do, or if the curve wasn't in the domain to begin with, this wouldn't make sense. Like you would just not be allowed to consider this, but it is something to worry about. And I think when I wrote the problem, I checked that it is, and I, you say so you could check, but I think in a problem like this, um, I don't know if I would worry about specifying that. <clears throat> Just a quick question, this curve is not a loop? Correct. Otherwise we would have gotten zero. Um, cool. Okay. Um, Yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. I really wanted to do this, but I I am pretty tired. <laughs> um, maybe maybe let me say this explicitly though, because um, I just got a private question. I got a private question about something that I was talking about earlier, which is when would we do this stuff that we just did? And maybe by that I is I think it's referring to like when would we use the fundamental theorem literally versus when would you find a new curve to integrate over? So the kind of the here's what maybe what I would think about this. I'll write this down. So um, if if you can find a potential function, then just use the fundamental theorem. That's the easiest thing to do. Um, if you can't find a potential function, Um, then hope that the curl is zero and look for a simply connected domain and then use path independence, then find a different curve. This may be a general description of the strategy. So if you can find a potential function, may as well use it. That's the easiest thing to do. If you can't find a potential function, then you, then you probably want to pick a different path. Um, so for this, this one that I wanted to do, I will say it's, it's almost literally the same as what I did in the video that I posted this morning. There's only superficial differences. The only reason why this one's kind of fun is because of this mess here, but it doesn't actually change anything. So, so aside from like this goofy looking thing here, it's, it's pretty much identical to the video that I posted this morning. What else did I have here? That was most of what I had planned. Yeah, we don't have to worry about that one. Yeah, we did pretty good. Yeah, center of mass stuff. So <clears throat> let me
let me just say this. This is going to be a lazy answer. I think I'm going to call it because I'm really tired. Um, but center of mass, I can stick around for some quick questions afterwards. But in terms of like the long examples, I probably, I'll probably call it. I'm starting to get a little loopy. Um, if you get a problem that says center of mass or centroid, this is just a dumb way to say compute this specific triple integral or double integral. So this is what I was saying earlier. There's nothing interesting or new about a center of mass or centroid problem. Um, as long as you know the formula, um, it's just setting up a formula and then you just have like a week two problem or something like that. Yeah, so you'd be given a mass density function and you just, you just integrate that, yeah. Okay, so maybe, let me do this. Um, thank you guys for spending your Friday night watching me do math. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised how many people choose to do that. But I'll officially end here. Um, good luck this weekend with the exam. See you guys next week. Like I said, I will, I can stick around and answer some quick questions. Otherwise, have a good one. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, so I got, let's see, a private question. Can I go over the parameterization for question two on quiz five? Um, it's a straight line from one, one, one to zero, zero, zero. Why is the parameterization that instead of negative t, negative t, negative t. So what would your t range be there? You would you could send t from negative one to zero. That would work too. Um, that seems like it'd work. Your parameter into your domain would be different. So you always need to talk about a domain when you talk about a parameterization. So that's the fix to that question. Um, quick question, practice midterm one on number two, how do they know that the bounds for you is from zero to one? I have no clue. Midterm, oh, midterm one. Number two. Oh, um, okay. So I also will say, I don't know if I'd worry so much about change of variable stuff. Um, I'd be surprised if there's a change of variables question, but I guess we'll see. So U is X. So what's the point? Um, If you look at this condition, let's try this. So y is v plus u squared, x is u, and x squared is u squared. Kill off the u's and we get this. So that's not quite what we want, but that's a bound for v. So then probably the x bound or the u bound comes from this equation. So let's translate this. So this would be zero. Z is w v squared. And y minus x squared squared is going to be v squared. So w goes from 0 to 1. Um, so how do we get u? 
It's probably coming from looking at equality here. So like this kind of thing in the x, y plane, you've got x squared and x. And so the y region is like between here. So the zero and one are coming from finding the intersection of x squared and x. I think that's where u is coming from, u being from zero to one. Oh, it looks like Kelly left already, but we all have no life on Friday nights like this. <laughs> yeah, can I scroll back up to the strategy about finding a potential function? Yes. Where was that? I don't know if that's what you're referring to. Or unless it was like up here. I don't know, maybe I'll scroll there for now. You can let me know if that's not what you were looking for. Um, Okay. Oh, and then, okay, our change of coordinates problem is likely to be on this midterm or were they more midterm one content? Like I said, I don't know for sure, but since it was midterm one stuff, I would think that probably not. I could be wrong. There could be change of coordinate stuff. Um, again, if I had to bet, I would say no. Yeah. I guess we'll see. We'll see in a couple hours. Oh, I never finished my salad. Yeah, so that's a good point about the three variable changes of coordinates problems. The only, like, we didn't really do much of that at all. Like, almost none of that. There's nothing in the homework about that or anything like that. So, um, oh, a piece of spinach just got stuck in my throat. Sorry, this is going to be gross. Hopefully you didn't have to hear that. Am I doing anything fun this weekend? My little brother is graduating from college tomorrow. <laughs> so I am going to zoom into his virtual graduation ceremony. And then after that, now I have a lot of work that I need to catch up on. I have to give a talk on Tuesday, so I need to prepare that. How have I been? I've been good. Busy. Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be, I don't really know what to expect. It'd be kind of weird. It's also weird to me that my little brother is now a college graduate. It's wild. He went to Rice in Houston. I guess I can stop recording. I don't know why I'm still recording this. <laughs>